Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the only online training course that makes a delicious gravy. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk all about cabling and the different types of cable. This comes to us from the CompTIA Network Plus certification exam requirements from the N10-004 exam. That's the latest Network Plus exam. In section 2.1, we need to understand how to categorize standard cable types and their properties. So we're going to look at a lot of different kinds of cables. These Cat3, Cat5, Cat5e, these are probably terms that you've heard before, but you weren't exactly certain what they really meant, this whole cat type thing. You've also got STP and UDP type cables. You've got different fiber connections. You've got coaxial cables. And we'll go through each one of those and give you an idea of what you need to know for the Network Plus exam. Let's start with understanding why cable is so important. After all, it's really what everything runs over. It is the foundation of what we do across the network. If our cable isn't good, everything else that we do, regardless of the protocols, regardless of the devices that we have on the network, regardless of the time that we've spent creating a, a very powerful network topology, goes to waste because the cabling itself and the underlying foundation isn't running well. You really only get one good opportunity at architecting this from the ground up. Usually you go into an environment and they already have a cable plant, which is what we call that infrastructure of cables and environment. If you're lucky enough to go into a new facility or you're building out a new building, then you have the ability from the ground up to put in uh, exactly what you want from a cabling perspective. So make sure that if you're going about doing that, research what you need to know and make that, imp that implementation of cable that you're putting in very, very very good. Now, what's interesting about this, if we look at cabling, you'll see that a lot of people will say, well, we're going to do wireless. We're not going to really spend a lot of time on cabling. But what they don't keep in mind, of course, is that eventually that wireless signal connects to a device that is connected to the rest of the network with, guess what, cable. So you still need to keep an idea of what's going on with cabling. The only people who really don't have to worry so much with cabling are amateur radio operators, although they'll tell you that their antennas that they set up, they're very specific with the type of cabling they put in just for the antenna part. So even then, you can't get away from the idea that just because it's wireless doesn't necessarily mean you can't think about the cable. Fortunately, there's a lot of standards in place for cabling. So you don't have to wonder if the cable that you're putting in is going to work properly for the type of network that you're implementing. One organization called the Electronic Industries Alliance, you'll see it abbreviated always as EIA. This is an alliance of trade organizations that got together and said, let's create some standardizations for these underlying cables. And that certainly helps all of these different trade associations implement and install things in a very standardized way. You'll see that the standards either start with RS dash something. If you recall from uh, other videos that we've done, there's an RS-232 port on the back of your computer. That's the standard associated with that serial connection. With cabling these days, you very often see the newer standards that start with an EIA number. And we're going to talk about some of those standards here. Some of those work with one of the industry associations under the EIA called the TIA or the Telecommunications Industry Association. So this association does a lot of things. It creates standards. It does trade shows. It does training. It does a market analysis. And it creates, along with the EIA, some standards. And for cabling, the standard you need to know is EIA-TIA 568. That's the magic number for cabling. This is the Commercial Building Telecommunications Cabling Standard. And whenever we reference back cables in our industry, we always go back to the TIA 568. And that's when we are always going to be looking at, and you can find on TIAonline.org to find out what's there. Now, you can't download that specification. As part of a standard, you have to pay for it. But this is one that you'll see written up in other places. And you'll probably rely on the people putting in your cable to make sure that it's up to these standards. Now that we know where the standards come from, let's talk about the different cable types that you'll see whenever you go into your organization or start looking around under the desk at what's there. A very common cable that you'll find there is twisted pair copper cabling. This is probably the piece that you'll see very most often in almost every organization. And it uses something called a balanced pair operation. You'll see this if you look at the specifications on how you should wire up the little jacks because there are 
two wires. One wire has one signal that we call a positive signal. The other wire has a signal we call a negative signal. So they're, they're opposite signals, and they're of equal strength. And this is very useful, because as they're going through this wire onto the other end, the other side can compare those two signals and see exactly the type of signal that was really supposed to come together. Even if there was interference on one side of that wire or the other, on the positive or the negative side, it can still make the exact signal that was coming through, even with all that interference. And it's really the twist that does that. That's why this is twisted pair cabling. As this cable is going through underneath the wall or behind the, the desk that you have, and it passes by some interference, as the twist goes by, the interference is going to switch from one side to the other and never just be on one side of this. And that's very useful because at the end, we'll do a comparison. And we can kind of make out what really happened during that time frame because one of those sides was OK. We missed, hopefully, part of that interference on one side of the twisted pair or another. So that's not just there for looks, and it's not just there because that's the way they built it. The twists are there for a purpose. And as you notice, as you go to higher grade cabling and cabling that can support higher speeds, you'll notice that the twists get tighter. And that's because the tighter the twist, then the better the signal is going to be at the other side for a number of reasons, not just interference, but also interference between the cables themselves, something called crosstalk. So as you, if you ever open up one of those cables, you, you pull the sheath off and you look inside of it, you'll see those twists there. And you'll notice if you see in your environment where people are creating their own cables, they try to keep all of those twists in place. That's very important. When you're working with cabling, you'll know there's a couple of types that you work with. One is a shielded cable, and the other is an unshielded cable. The shielded cable is really what it sounds like. There is a metal shield inside of the cable, either wrapping all the way around the cable or around the individual pairs of wires inside of the cable. And it's really there to prevent interference, especially in very harsh environments on a manufacturing floor. There's a lot of electrical equipment. You may want to use shielded cable just to make sure that nothing else is affecting the signal that's going by. And you'll notice it also has a little piece of metal sticking out of it. That's because it needs an electrical ground for that shielding to really work. So you can't just put in shielded cable and think that you're protected. It does have to be installed properly. Usually, most people are using unshielded twisted pair, which is less expensive, but it doesn't have that shielded in there. So if you're going through one of those environments where you're passing near a fluorescent light, there's a possibility, a much larger possibility, that an unshielded twisted pair cable is going to have some interference associated associated with that. This is really the most common. It's the most inexpensive. And in most environments, you don't have to deal very much with very harsh or very strong interference. So UTP seems to work just fine for that. If you've done any work with cabling, then you've probably heard the term Cat3, Cat5, Cat6. What is all of these cats? And how did they get into our computer room? Well, it's not cats. It stands for category. The first type of really formalized category was a type of cable called category 3. And this was built when we needed some type of standardization when both Ethernet and a topology called token ring were becoming very popular in a twisted pair environment. So category 3 was one that supported 10 megabit Ethernet and what was at the time 4 megabit token ring. So very low speeds compared to the types of Ethernet speeds that we see today. But at the time, this category 3 allowed us to be able to use those speeds of networks. Well, they we outgrow those very quickly and soon move to something called category 5. Now, category 5 was built because we needed higher speeds. We needed to be able to support 100 megabit Ethernet across these connections. And it still needed to be on unshielded twisted pair. So we created this category 5, which had some additional requirements. It had a different set of twists. It had a different set of cabling, a different set of requirements associated with it. But soon we found that we needed faster. We needed better. So it's really even hard to find just Cat5 cable today. Usually you find Category 5E, which was an upgrade to Category 5 that allowed us to do 1 gigabit Ethernet throughput through that single twisted pair cable. Very tight specifications for the cable, very tight specifications even for the connectors. You have to have the right kind of connectors on the end of it. But that Category 5E allowed us to go up to speeds of 1 gigabit per second. And usually people will put in Cat5E these days and make sure that they're just covered regardless 
regardless. It's even hard to find Category 5 anymore. Category 6 is really one of the latest categories of Unshielded Twisted Pair. On Category 6, we can go up to 10 gigabit Ethernet through copper. Uh, and we can go up to 55 meters on that Category 6. There is another specification called Category 6A. And for Category 6A, I can go up to 100 meters of 10 gigabit Ethernet. Now, the problem you're going to find is that if you see a picture of an unshielded twisted pair like this one here, just looking at it, you're never quite certain exactly what category it is. Fortunately, usually on the, the side, on the, the shielding itself, on the outside sheath of the cable, you will see some printing there that tells you what category that cable is. So just look down the cable and you'll start to see it. This cable here with this very, very tight twist on it is a category six cable. So you can see it, it looks normal to me. There's nothing different in the colors of the cables. The only difference is that it's a different type of twisting and different requirements for implementing it in your organization. There's a specialized set of cable that we call the plenum cable. The plenum is a term that's used to describe the heating or the air conditioning space that's above a facility. So if we look up there, you can put cables into the plenum. Now, because the plenum has all of this air in it, it is for air conditioning and for heating, there, it is a rich environment of oxygen. And if there is any type of fire in an organization, the plenum is one that is a great resource for the fire because there's plenty of oxygen for the fire to use. And because of that, if you put any cables in the plenum, you have to make sure that those cables are rated so that they will not burn through. You don't want the cable to actually move the fire into other parts of the building. Now, there's another section of the building called the riser. And that riser is really the section that goes between floors of a building. There's different types of cable that you'll need depending on if you're in the plenum or if you are in the riser. The riser requirements aren't quite as strict as plenum cable. So you'll find that some people will even put plenum cable in the riser to use as riser cable, you can't do the reverse. You can't use riser cable in your plenum. So it's a little bit different. You have to really talk to the people who are in charge of your cabling, in charge of the fire requirements for your area, to make sure that if you put cable in your plenum or in your riser, you're using the right kind. And these days, people are finding that perhaps they shouldn't be putting cable in the plenum. They'll find a different place, maybe under the floor, to put the cable. It depends on how the manufacturing construction is done for your organization. The thing that keeps the fire resistance for these cables is really the jacket of the cable. And that sheath can be made of really two different kinds of plastics these days. There's a polyvinyl chloride, PVC, very common type of plastic or that we see out in the industry, and a newer kind called a fluorinated ethylene polymer, an FEP. So if you see those abbreviations, a PVC or an FEP, they're usually referring to this type of cable jacket and one that you can use to put in a plenum or a riser, depending on what the fire code is for your area. Coaxial cables have been around networking for a very long time. In fact, they're still around today, and we're about to find out exactly where we see some of those things. Coaxial is a term that means that two or more forms within something share a common access. So you can see that in this cable, it's unlike twisted pair. There's no twisting of anything. It's everything is in the straight axis back and forth here. In the very center of the cable is a wire conductor. That's where, really where everything is running over. And wrapped around that is a dielectric insulator that's preventing any type of electrical connecti conductivity to the wire conductor inside of that. There's usually a metal shielding that's around all of that. It's kind of nice to have. And that is all protected by a plastic jacket. And we used to use this a lot with very old Ethernet networks, something called TinBase 5 or ThickNet, used a coaxial type called an RG8 uh, slash U and a 10 base 2 Ethernet network, which a little more prevalent is called ThinNet, and that used a cable type called RG58. These days, we see that a lot of these cables are used with television and digital cable. That's what we have coming into our homes. And that digital cable these days is very prevalent for cable modems. So we're seeing that coaxial cables still a major part of our networking infrastructure really around the world. Serial cables have also been around for quite some time. Serial cables first created so that we could send one bit from one device to a bit on the other side. And they go a bit at a time back and forth through those. You see them a lot with modems. You see them a lot with devices that need to directly connect to each other. And it's a bit of a slower form of communication, but it's still one that's very prevalent today. One way that you can connect two devices together was something called a null modem cable, where there's not really a modem in the middle of it. It's just a cable that goes from one device to another. But you change the pinout so that it simulates the fact that a modem might be in the middle of that. We call that a null modem cable. 
you often will use these null modem cables or serial cables if you are configuring devices on your network. So you may have gotten a switch or a router that you're implementing in your environment, and that switch will have on the outside of it a serial connection. It's very standardized. So around the world, anybody could plug in a serial connection with that serial cable and plug the other end into their computer, and now they're able to manage, configure, and set up that, that router or that switch so that it works properly in your environment. These days, USB seems to have replaced the serial port. Newer computers don't even have serial ports on them any longer, and you end up having to get these adapters that have a USB connection on one end End and a serial connection on the other just so you can plug into the serial ports that are on these devices. Most networks have a combination of copper type cables with shielded or unshielded twisted pair cables and optical fiber cables. And optical fiber cables are unique because they don't carry an electrical signal. They just carry light from one end to the other. Uh, what happens here is that we're able to go over very long distances at very high bandwidths because light allows us to do a lot on a very short amount of time with very little interference. So they're used a lot on very long runs, runs between buildings, or runs where you want to be sure that the connection between devices could never be affected by any type of interference. There are two types of fiber that you will see. One is a multi-mode fiber, and one is a single-mode fiber. And what I've done here is do a very rudimentary description of why this is called multi-mode. That's because the light, when it goes through the fiber, can bounce around in different modes till it gets to the other side. And then the other end, it could show up in many different parts of this fiber. Multi-mode fibers usually go over shorter distances, and they don't require such strong lights on the end, the LEDs or the lasers, to send that traffic through. Single-mode fibers are a lot different. They have a tighter specification. They usually are much smaller in the, the size of them. And you can see the, the idea is that the light moves in one direction all the way through in a single mode, which is why we call it a single-mode fiber. That fiber, again, a little more expensive. And the lights and the lasers are a little more powerful on both sides. You really see single-mode fiber when you're going over extremely long distances. Here's an example of some optical fibers. You can see that inside of this fiber is exactly the same type of fiber, but the connectors on the end vary. You'll see three or four different kinds of connectors for optical connections. So whenever you say to somebody, I need a fiber patch or I need an optical fiber cable to connect devices, the next logical question you're going to get is, what type of connectors do they need to be? Do they need to be this older style ST connector or do they need to be kind of a newer style SC connector? There are also some other smaller types of connectors. So make sure that you understand exactly what you're going to need. You can't just ask for a fiber. You're going to need to know whether it's single mode or multi mode and the type of connector you'll need on the end of it. Let's see how much we remember about cable types. Let's get our first question. What twisted pair cabling type provides additional protection against interference? There was one specific kind of twisted pair cabling that gave us that ability, and it was shielded twisted pair. You'll hear it referred to as STP. Another question, which category of cable supports 1,000 megabit Ethernet? 1,000 megabit Ethernet, that's a little bit of a trick question. 1,000 megabit Ethernet is also the same as 1 gigabit Ethernet. And the category that's supported there is a category 5E or a category 6. Those are the two types that you would need if you're planning to do gigabit Ethernet over a copper cable. Next question, which fiber type is designed for long distance communication? If you recall, there was a very specific fiber that really was used whenever you need to go over very long distances, and that was single mode fiber. That's the one that you will see the most whenever you need to go over 10, 15, or 20 kilometers. That's our cable types module on section 2.1. We've looked at all of these different categories. We've gone through shielding and unshielded. We've gone through fiber types, coax types, and even talked about the differences between plenum and non-plenum type configurations. For many more Network Plus videos, to participate in our message boards, or to send me an email, visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.